Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Anna Bone and I am the principal at Pathfinder Elementary in the Platte County School District. We are located just south of KCI Airport in Kansas City. Most of our campus is located up in Platte City, Missouri, but my building is located right off of I-29 and Berry Road. So I have the pleasure today of sharing Pathfinder Structured Literacy Journey with you um, through the Live Mighty Network. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen and, um, oh, maybe not share my screen. Shauna, it looks like you might have to, oh, there we go. <laughs> She's going to let me share my screen so that I can um, go ahead and share my slides. So as soon as I pop this up, that means that I will not be able to see um, those that pop in, questions that pop up, things like that. So I will try to routinely check the chat for those types of things. All right, so we have about 30 minutes here together today with a little bit of time built in for questions after that um, to talk about um, Pathfinder Elementary's journey and Platte County's journey um, through structured literacy at the elementary level. So um, this is a presentation that I got to share with my phonics vertical team at the Missouri Literacy Summit this summer in Columbia, Missouri. And then we were asked to share it again today. Um, most of my teachers are out of the building at this point in time, so you're stuck with just me. But that being said, please feel free to pop any questions you have in the chat. Um, and if I can't answer them, I'm guessing one of my teammates can and I can reach out to them. So this is me. Like I said, I am the principal at Pathfinder Elementary. Um, and this is my team. So on our vertical team at Pathfinder, we had our reading interventionist, Jen Wright, and then a kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Ahmad. Um, a kindergarten teacher, now instructional coach, um, Ashley Seidel, a second grade teacher, Mrs. Barbie Glidewell, a first grade teacher, Mrs. Platts, and our instructional coach, Mindy Wheeler. So everything you're going to see today is a product of um, a lot of work from these ladies here and some other folks even throughout our building. So if we were live at the moment, which we're not, um, I would ask that participants go ahead and write their name, what their role is, and their grade spans served in the chat, um, just so I can tailor um, my focus a little bit more to what people are needing. This is Platte County. So in Platte County, we have about 4,000 students at this point in time. Um, and like I said earlier, the majority of our campus is located up um, in this northern quadrant of the district uh, by the Kansas City Airport. We are located down in, let's see if I can minimize this, this blue nugget down at the south end of the district, about 15 miles south of our district. So um, in Platte County, we have three elementary schools, so we're relatively small. Um, and you can see that our race and ethnicity breakdown on the left. So the reason I point this out is because um, Pathfinder does not necessarily line up to exactly what our district demographic is. So at Pathfinder, like I said, we're down in this little blue nugget and we serve um, over 600 students this year um, in grades K through four, simply because we do not have room for the fifth graders. We are a very transient school building. Um, last year on our September count date, 24% of our students were new to Pathfinder that school year. So you can kind of see that we border several different school districts. Um, that's why I call it the nugget. You can go about 100 feet in any direction um, and you're in a different school district. So our average class size is around 20 students and our free and reduced lunch rate is sitting right around that 25% rate, which um, some districts would balk at and say, wow, that's so low. But in County, that's relatively high. Our race and ethnicity breakdown looks a little bit different than our school district as well. So you could tell that our district is about 74% white and we are sitting about 55% white with a much more um, ethnically diverse population. Um, and that comes across in the languages spoken here at Pathfinder as well. We are also a leader in me school, just something um, to kind of keep in mind as we work our way through some of the um, things tied to structured literacy today. So today, um, our goal is to be able to evaluate Platt County's journey in developing a structured literacy approach, articulate the importance of shared vocabulary and common instructional practices, 
and then identify components of effective tier one phonics instruction. So we won't have time to go super, super in depth with a lot of these things. So I'm going to try to provide um, a, a general overview. And then if you have any questions or follow up, anything like that, you're welcome to reach out. Um, I will also share these slides with Shauna so that she has them. There's a lot of hot links in there um, and things like that that people are welcome to take a look at. So if we were live, again, I would ask you to go ahead and set your own personal intention for today. I've outlined three learning targets, but those might not be the learning targets that you're here for, um, or um, you might want to focus on one more than the other. Like I said, if you have questions, if we have people that pop in, um, go ahead and just shoot those in the chat and we'll address those at the end. Okay, so a little bit about our journey. So I have been at Pathfinder. This is my fifth year at Pathfinder. It is my first year as principal. Um, and I served as the assistant principal for the four years prior. So um, a lot of this work started pre-COVID, just right pre-COVID and has um, evolved and changed over the course of COVID. So in 2019, in the winter, that is kind of as a building when we said, okay, we've got to do something about our foundational skills approach. Um, we had we have amazing teachers, but what was happening in one second grade classroom looked completely different than what was happening in another second grade classroom. We had some kindergarten teachers that were teaching VAL teams in October and then others that weren't touching them at all. So um, we knew that that was a need, period. Um, so right before COVID, um, probably about two weeks before things shut down in 2020, we had an interest group that um, on a volunteer basis met to develop an initial scope and sequence that was K2 for phonics instruction. So that was 100% voluntarily based, and we actually were able to continue that through COVID and meet virtually. So our goal was to go ahead and get a scope and sequence out um, because we are not a huge district. We don't have a, a big district budget. Um, so, you know, we were not able at that time to support um, purchasing a product, providing a bunch of professional development around a product or a program. Um, so that was kind of the approach that we took as a building. In fall of 2020, when everybody came back, um, we moved to having some vertical teams in our building. So everyone was on either math, reading, writing, or phonics on that vertical team. And so our phonics vertical team really worked to um, use that new scope and sequence and create consistent unit plans for their team members to use in a way that would unify all first grade phonics instruction, all kindergarten phonics instruction, and all second grade phonics instruction. So we kind of ran that for a school year and kind of fast forward to spring of 21. Um, and at that point in time, we um, were tasked with creating a foundational skills curriculum for our um, district. And so this is something that we were compensated for, but we started to really revise that scope and sequence and expanded it to third grade and really worked on unpacking um, those power standards in a way that were going to be meaningful to teachers on a large scale. Also that spring, we created a decoding assessment in alignment with that curriculum and those unit plans. Fast forward to last school year, and we did a lot last school year. So we piloted our new scope and sequence for K-3, all the unpacked curriculum documents, and the assessments. So we provided professional development at the building level on all of these things, as well as the components of effective phonics instruction that we're going to go through later, very briefly. Um, we did all of these things at, at the building level. And, um, you know, that was kind of the intent when it came to this work. And really what ended up happening is we saw that it worked. We saw that it worked at Pathfinder with our population, even given our transients, um, our linguistic diversity, our ethnic diversity. We saw that this worked. I mean, it worked for teachers too. So what ended up happening was that our district ended up compensating our team for that vertical work. And um, now it's being used district-wide. So the scope and sequence, the assessments, the unpacked documents, the proficiency scales, all of those things, which is super cool. And then this summer, our entire district um, received science of reading professional development, um, which we co-taught with KCR PDC in our area, which was very, very, very cool. 
Um, some other miscellaneous things um, that happened over the course of these last couple school years um, is we were actually able to gather a lot of materials through some different venues. So our PTA is very supportive. And then I mentioned that we are a Title I building as well. And so we were able to use a lot of those funds to create a book room full of decodable text that allowed us to do some of these things a little bit easier for teachers. Um, our district had a huge push for structured literacy PD for our tier two staff reading improvement. And then last year, our SPED staff received that same um, professional development as well. This is a little bit of our data and we don't have this year's data yet, obviously, um, but we are a standards-based school um, so and district. So this is our decoding reporting topic and the percentage of students that have reached a four on that decoding reporting topic. Four in Platte County is mastery, it is not exceeds. So you can kind of see the light blue is 2020-21 and the dark blue is 2021-22. Um, what's really distinct here in kindergarten is what exactly a four looks like got clearly defined between 21 and 22. But you can see that the students that receive that consistent phonics instruction, regardless of COVID, regardless of quarantines, all of those things, 65% of our students in first grade last year got a four on their decoding reporting topic, met those grade level expectations. We thought that was pretty fantastic considering the, the factors um, working against us, 24% transients, quarantines, COVID, all of those things. And additionally, this is a huge win as well. Um, the kiddos that received that consistent phonics instruction in first grade didn't even get the kindergarten consistency, um, jumped from 39% proficiency to 68 proficiency last year, which is really cool. Another celebration in kindergarten, um, we got clear on what exactly a four was going to be. Um, and a four in kindergarten for us is all vowels, um, all consonants, names and sounds, as well as being able to blend uh, real and nonsense CBC words accurately. So 61% of our kindergartners last year were able to do that. However, there were 84% of our students that had a three, which means they were just missing a few sounds or had a few blending mistakes with CBC. So again, a huge win, not 100% perfect, um, but we had a lot of kids that were, that were very close. So again, when we say um, we saw this work with our kids, we, we really did. So the bulk of our work was around creating a scope and sequence for kindergarten, first, second, and third for decoding. Um, we have phonemic awareness built into our daily schedule at the tier one level in kindergarten and first grade that's using Hegarty, but really we needed, we needed some sort of guidance as far as who was going to teach what in the area of phonics. So that was one of our, our main products was the scope and sequence related to those things. So there's some hot links in there. Like I said, um, feel free to take a gander at those. And now I need to figure out how to hide this so I can get back to my slides. There we go. Okay. Um, so that was one of our main products was the scope and sequence. And we really took a lot of time um, in piloting this and then really revising it. Um, to make sure that we had an appropriate pacing and um, appropriate scaffolding from kindergarten to first grade to second to third. Um, and that really guides our teachers' work. But that day-to-day -day instruction is not left up to chance either. So the scope and sequence was a great starting place, um, but we did have uh, our vertical team that developed unit plans in conjunction with these um, power standards in these units um, so that that consistent day-to-day -day instruction was pretty solid as well. Another curricular product over here on the right is an example of an unpacked standard in our district. And um, that is, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's taking that uh, power standard or that priority standard from DESE in that grade level and really breaking it down based on what our expectations are um, and how that scaffolds on vocabulary that they've already been taught. We've also made some shifts as a district this school year related to assessment. Um, what we were finding is that our assessment approach and our assessment programs were not at all um, supportive of what it is we needed to tell parents about their kids as readers. I mean, frankly, the information that we needed about them as instructors as well. So in the area of phonemic awareness, we moved from giving the PAA, which is the phonemic awareness assessment, um, very similar to Kilpatrick's 
um, past drill. We gave that to some students in years past, just the ones that flagged at risk. And now we've moved to K-1 across the board. Every student is assessed based on phonemic awareness and we report out to parents on those things. Phonics, um, teams kind of had their own assessments that they used uh, based on what they thought was important in years past. This year we have a consistent decoding assessment that builds K-3. Um, we have a consistent heart words assessment um, that builds K-2. And those are non-phonetic words that we've identified, things that are non-phonetic based on our scope and sequence. Um, and then FastBridge is something that we utilize now as a school district. We used to utilize STAR. Um, and FastBridge has a lot of subtests that um, really support structured literacy practices as well. We've also made a shift from utilizing running records, so reporting out letters to parents, um, to utilizing a CBM or a curriculum-based measure, as well as the comprehension components contained in that. From an assessment standpoint, um, we developed both a decoding assessment, like I mentioned earlier, that builds K-3 and a heart words assessment. The decoding assessment, and both of those are hot linked. Um, the decoding assessment starts at that kindergarten threshold of letters and sounds and builds all the way up through third grade expectations as well. Um, this is the teacher version of this, so it's not quite as pretty as the student version, but, um, but it provides a little bit of guidance as far as when to stop with students. And so we found that to be very helpful. Again, the heart words assessment was developed by our team as well. Um, we essentially took Dolch words, Fry words, um, Orton Gillingham, most important words, things like that, and lined them all up and said, all right, which of these are actually phonetic based on our scope and sequence? Let's get rid of those. We can assess those elsewhere and really try to pick out the ones that are non-phonetic based on our scope and sequence. Um, and really try to pare down what we are asking kids to, to know by heart, essentially. Um, we used to have 115 um, quote unquote sight words that kids were supposed to know, but we didn't explicitly teach any of them. And the difference here is that we explicitly teach all of these throughout the course of that K-2 career. Okay. So moving on to vocabulary. So we had this scope and sequence and we had unpacked units and we had assessments and we had this great plan for who was going to teach what and when it was going to happen and how it was going to tie, um, you know, to the next grade level. And then our task was to really hone in on that day-to-day -day instruction. But before we could even do that, we had to make some executive decisions about vocabulary in our building um, and as a result in our district um, to get unified on how we were going to address things with kids. So when we look at the simple view of reading, all of our work so far right now has lived in that word recognition category. Um, and it is just now that we are venturing into that language comprehension, reading comprehension um, area of things, but the rest of this work will really be tied around word recognition. So as far as vocabulary goes, we had a lot going on um, in our building, in our district, and frankly, I, th I don't think this is a unique experience, at least in the metro area. So as far as vocabulary goes, we had, um, we had people teaching bossy E. We had people teaching magic E, zombie E, uh, sneaky E, um, all of these different things that they were using to help kids remember um, what exactly these concepts meant. And unintentionally, that created confusion for kids. So as we kind of honed in on how we were going to use these unit plans and implement the scope and sequence, we had to make some decisions about vocabulary as a building. Here are some big overarching things that we landed on as far as vocabulary and strategies go. So for vocabulary, the first main thing that we did was we selected CLOVER as our acronym for our syllable types. Um, I've heard REVLOC be used before as well, which comes in useful um, as kids progress through skills, but we felt like CLOVER was just a little bit more kid friendly um, and was a tie that we could make to our tier two and tier three, so our reading improvement and SPED programming as well. So that is the acronym that we use for syllable types, period, across the district. We had to come up with some strategies that um, we could all live with because they would be put in those unit plans. And again, these are things that are used tier one, tier two, and tier three. So the first one of that is COPS, which is a dictation checking strategy. 
Um, some people were using cups. There were some things that were just kind of all over the place. Um, the second strategy is SOS or finger spelling, finger tapping. And then the third one is penciling, um, which is a kinesthetic writing strategy used for fluency. So all of those strategies are expectations. Um, all teachers have been taught those um, strategies. They are written within the unit plans. And again, they are practiced across the tiers. We also had to make some decisions about some spelling rules and generalizations um, because we had people calling those different things as well, or not a ton of awareness around spelling rules, which is totally fine, right? That's our job is to equip our educators with um, the tools that they need to provide clarity for kids. And this was a huge aha for us as we taught these rules to adults. And we had um, so many adults that were saying, I never knew. I never knew. That's why the word duck has CK at the end. So we had to make some decisions about spelling generalizations. And you can see there are the four that we landed on that we thought were um, biggest, biggest bang for our buck. So more true, often more true than not, if that makes sense. So this is an example of the Clover anchor chart. Again, you can kind of see um, how that acronym flows. We move from closed syllables um, and we don't go in order. So we don't teach closed syllables, then consonant plus LE, then open. We don't go in order, um, but this provides a good framework for when kids master or are introduced to a new syllable type. Where does this fit into Clover and how close are we to mastery? These are examples of our spelling rules anchor charts. We decided on four um, that uh, were frequent enough that we felt like it was important to teach. So those are the floss rule, the kitty cat or cat kite rule, soldier rule, and then hard and soft C and G. So those are all high impact strategies and rules that we taught to our adults because they are expectations written within the unit plans. And this just guarantees that when I've got a kindergartner um, that comes to me at the end of the year and I'm putting them in a first grade class, I know that that first grade teacher can tell um, that cat kite rule has been taught and floss rule has been taught. It's not the fizzle rule, it's not the scaredy S rule, it's the floss rule. And when we talk about the floss rule, kids know what that means. And when they go to reading improvement, they know what that means. So we have that tie, um, which frankly, I'm not sure you get when you have a tier one resource and then a tier two resource and a tier three resource. So that vocabulary piece was a huge advantage for us. Simultaneous oral spelling or SOS. This is one of those strategies that I mentioned that was a common strategy across our building and now across our district. Um, and this is just finger tapping. So um, we say a word. So we say the word is cat. You would say cat. And then we tap it out. K at one tap per phoneme. So if the word was chat, it would be ch at. And then students sound and write. First sound, ch. And then they would write C H A A T T. And then blend it under chat or cat. So that is a strategy that we've utilized across our district um, and found phenomenal success with that. But that's an expectation within those unit plans as well. With our younger readers, this can be kind of challenging. We teach this to our kindergartners um, right about this time of year. It is what we are absolutely thankful for um, during Thanksgiving time is that we don't have to do left to right SOS with our kindergartners any longer. Um, so students struggle with that. Um, our younger ones, we always tap left to right. So there are a lot of things that we built into our unit plans and taught our adults to teach our kids to do to make that a little bit easier. So using those finger tapping hands, using blending strips, or in some cases, even using cubes and pushing those cubes or tiles up for each sound really helps um, scaffold that for kids whose dexterity is not there to be able to do the finger tapping 100%. Um, correctly. Penciling was the other strategy that we mentioned, um, and that really is as simple as um, running a kid running their pencil under a word as they blend it out loud. So um, it provides an opportunity for them to track their fluency. It provides teacher an opportunity if they're following along with their pencil above the word to stop and um, do a nonverbal cue to a student who maybe has read something incorrectly um, and really trains that left to right concept of print as well. So there is a video linked in there as well for those of you who are curious. 
Again, I mentioned COPS was a strategy that we utilized to um, proof our dictation, and that happens K3 in those unit plans, um, but that is common language and common strategy. Okay, last learning target has to do with the day-to-day -day instruction. So we identified components of effective tier one instruction, and there's several links here. There's a note-taking guide, which kind of outlines the different components and the purpose of each of them. I think that's important. And then there's also an example of a student workbook page from a unit plan as well. So for those of you who are curious, those links are there. Feel free to take a gander at those. But when I say we have a unit plan and then the students on their workbook page sheet do X, Y, and Z, this is what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly um, because everything is linked there. But based on research, based on our work as a phonics vertical team within letters, we identified a framework for a phonics lesson plan. And it's, it's not anything groundbreaking compared to um, you know, some other programs out there, but the difference is we have spread that out over a couple of days. So I think kindergarten, it's a two-day lesson plan. So everything you see on this screen happens within two days. Uh, first grade, it's actually a three-day lesson plan. And then second and third, it goes back down to two days, which really makes a lot of sense when you look at the bulk that happens within first grade. So in every single two to three day lesson, these components are present. So we review, we review several different ways um, through a concept deck. Um, so what is a consonant? What is a vowel? What is the floss rule? Activating relevant schema for that day. So if I know I'm gonna teach floss rule that day, I know that I need to review um, what a closed syllable is. I know I need to review what a consonant is. Um, and I know I also need to review my phonemes um, and my graphemes, F, L, S, and Z. Um, so we do a very comprehensive review based on concept deck, phoneme, grapheme, which is basically just flashcards, and then an auditory drill. So kids on their workbook page, what says, and if we've taught them floss, we would hope that they would write F um, and then also write FF and then be able to say, well, at the end of a closed syllable, short vowel word that ends in F, I know I have to double that consonant. We teach our new concept with a very clear learning target. We provide examples and non-examples. There's really not a lot of guessing that happens and it always builds on previously taught skills. So this could be a concept, um, a new spelling, a new rule, a new phoneme, a new syllable type, um, but we give several examples and we don't leave a lot up to chance. So um, gone are the days of, what? how do you think you spell You know this sound? It's this is the sound, this is how you spell it, this is where you'll find it in a word, let's practice. What happens with your lips, your tongue, and your teeth during that time? Okay, let's come up with some words that you hear that phoneme, always coming back to you and that auditory drill piece. We use multi-sensory strategies when we have a new phoneme to teach. So if we are teaching, I keep using floss rule today, um, if we are teaching the SS in floss rule, so we double the S at the end of a short vowel um, closed syllable word, then we would use a multi-sensory strategy to trace the word S um, and then do the sound that it makes. So it might be S, S, so doing that in the sand, um, on the carpet, on our jeans, on the table, really utilizing some of those multi-sensory strategies. And that's where people get really creative, which is really fun. We practice reading every day. Sometimes it's a few words, sometimes it's a phrase, um, sometimes it's sentences, but we practice reading every day within those unit plans. And the unit plans reading practice is always tied to the skill and builds on previously taught skills as well as previously taught heart words. It's super important. We do have um, a book library in our building of decodable texts, which is very helpful for small groups um, and additional practice, but people do not have their own set of full decodable readers in their classrooms. That reading practice is built into the unit plans. We practice spelling um, in every lesson using that SOS strategy, that finger tapping strategy. Um, again, utilizing words um, and patterns that have already been explicitly taught um, and are not tricky. 
we do move into tricky or non-phonetic words on our heart words. So you heard me say that we've moved from having 115 heart words down to 63 um, and really being intentional about this is when this is explicitly taught. This is when this is explicitly taught. Um, so instruction related to heart words as well as heart word review is built into those lesson plans as well. We utilize a lot of multi-sensory strategies with those things as well. And then last step in every two to three day lesson is dictation. And this is a cumulative application of skills as well as the new skill from that day, as well as heart words. So those things build as well. And we follow a protocol for dictation and then utilize the COPS strategy to check. So all of those things tie very well together. Um, but that is our approach to structured literacy in Platte County. So I know we are recording. Um, Shauna, do you have any information or any additional questions for me? Okay. All right, Shauna, I will send you a copy of these slides and the links and everything should work. I'm totally fine with you leaving my email. And that is all I have. So I hope you have a great night. Okay, thank you. Bye.